very brief lecture. Um, this role of chairs is not reserved for the great and the good. It's reserved for the microphone. Uh, so if there's questions uh, at any point in the uh, evening, uh, this is where you have to come to ask the question because uh, we're thanks to that speaker uh, over there. Just a few practical things before I introduce our lecturer for this evening. In the unlikely event of an emergency, uh, the escape hatches are the door that you came in and another door on the right-hand side of the chancel. Uh, there's an order of precedence for leaving. It's priests first. <laughs> Okay, so Father Andrew, Father Luke, you know that we're out first. Because I always believe we need to be out there to minister to the needs of those who are traumatized by what they've left behind. Uh, we don't charge for the lectures, uh, but there will be a plate uh, close to the door, and we would invite you, please, to make a donation to help us cover the cost uh, of this evening. Now, I'm sure some of you have already discovered that there is coffee and tea and biscuits on sale and for those who want the hard stuff um, that's to the right hand side where uh, Barry and Sheila will very generously serve you a nice glass of wine. I have to say you're all very brave uh, for uh, putting up with that weather and making the effort to be with us this evening. I've had numerous phone calls and messages all throughout the day of people apologizing that they're not going to risk it. So well done for you. And now, who has come the furthest? I think my son has come from Reading. Reading? Yeah. Right. He came, from, he came from Reading and her son's come from uh, Kingston on Thames. Oh wow, now that, that beats me. I've come <laughs> half a mile up the road. <laughs> Can anybody top Reading? Okay, I'll have to sit down and Google those two to see who has actually got the furthest. <laughs> now, Father Luke has uh, books uh, for sale. Uh, they're at the back of the church. I'm sure he'll be given a plug uh, to that as well. Um, they're on sale for £10. So good value, hardback book uh, on sale for £10 at the back of the church. We're delighted to be able to welcome uh, Father Luke uh, and Harry uh, to church uh, this evening. Um, Father Luke is the curator of the Marguerite Kemp Centre in King Glynn and the honorary secretary of the Marguerite Kemp Society. And I have to confess, I know very little about Marguerite Kemp. So I'm looking forward to learning something this evening, because as you can tell from my accent, I'm not Norfolk born and bred. <laughs> um, if you wanted to ask me about some of the Irish things, I might do a much better job. So hopefully this will take my education uh, further tonight, but Father Luke, you are very welcome to South Britain, and Harry as well. Over to you. Thank you. No, you can't go home quite yet. <laughs> come here, come over here and lie down, dear. Yep. I know you've heard it before. <laughs> down, down. There we are. Good boy. Bless him, he's only two. <laughs> he, uh, qualified in May this year, wasn't it? So he's doing a good job, a very good job. I must say, you have the most beautiful church here. Um, it's good that you've got a number of the photos of the painted angels online, so that I can really, really enjoy them. Um, very, very beautiful. They have the, the sculptures and the saturary and the icon which is a joy to see very very lovely indeed
In answering the question, who is Marjorie Kemp? I'm going to first look, as she did, to Julian of Norwich. Um, it says in the first book, it's actually the books, if you like, books of Marjorie Kemp. Uh, there's an introduction, there's a first book, a second book, and then uh, her prayers that she writes at the end. Well, in chapter 18 of the first book, she was commanded by our Lord to go to an anchoress who was named Julian. And so she did, and told her about the grace which God had placed in her soul of compunction, contrition, sweetness and devotion, compassion with holy meditation and deep contemplation, and very many holy speeches and conversations that our Lord spoke to her soul. And also many wonderful revelations which she described to the anchoress to find out if there were any deception in them. For the anchoress was expert in such things and could give good advice. The anchoress, hearing the marvelous goodness of our Lord, highly thanked God with all her heart for his visitation, advising that this creature to be obedient to the will of our Lord and fulfill with all her might whatever he placed in her soul. Yes, I'm, I'm very fond of you too, love, but we need to get that. That's it, good boy. The great was the holy conversation that the anchoress and this creature, Marjorie always refers to herself as this creature, except on one occasion where her name is written. Great was the holy conversation that the anchoress and this creature had through talking of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ for the many days that they were together. Would you like to be with Ellen? Would that be nice? Yes. Is Ellen about? Yes. Lovely. And then you can take some photos. There are. <laughs> Thanks. Good boy. In his foreword um, to my latest book, I'm sure you've seen it at the back of the church. There we are. That's the one that I'm plugging, using Clive, Father Clive's words, plugging this evening. In his foreword to my book, Julian of Norwich's Literary Legacy, Bishop Graham writes, During the heights of the coronavirus pandemic, I was struck by how many people drew on the writings of Julian of Norwich to find solace at times of national as well as personal anxiety. Perhaps that was because Julian's writings help us pause from the pressures and uncertainties of contemporary life. Might her words carry a resonance down the centuries about how to live well amongst so much angst? This best-selling medieval author continues to reach new audiences, Bishop Graham writes audiences from around the world encountering in the writing a hope-filled life. Julian lived through a time of deep crisis. The first wave of the Great Plague is the um, or the great terror, as, as the Black Death was known, happened when Julian was six. If you just think to yourselves what you were like when you were six. It was not called the Black Death until centuries later, but during that first wave, from spring to late summer, 1349, half, half of the 13,000 population of Norwich is thought to have died. Death would have come to every street and every family, Bishop Graham writes. Anxiety must have been immense. He, he goes on to write, 
Five more cycles of plague would return during Julian's life, along with war, drought, and famine. All of these times must have affected her body and soul, and I wonder how they influenced her writing. How indeed. Julian's writings, her revelations of divine love, have succeeded in remaining in the public favor since their inception. The revelations come down to us in two texts, the short text and the long text. Short text from the late 15th century and the long text from the late 16th, early 17th century. Not so the writings of Marjorie Kemp. The unique, the only copy, only manuscript copy of the book of Marjorie Kemp was discovered in 1934. It was during a game of ping pong in the library of Colonel William Butler Bowden's Georgian house uh, near Chesterfield, known as Southgate, during the summer of 1934, when one of young Morris Butler Bowden's friends down from Oxford happened to tread on one of those balls by accident. Morris remarks, one of us trod on the ping pong ball and my father went to the cupboard to get out a replacement. And it was soon apparent that he was having difficulty in finding either a bat or a ball. There was in there an entirely undisciplined clutter of smallish leather books, medieval books. Morris recounted his father's exasperation at this pile of book, book clutter. I'm going to put this whole lot on the bonfire tomorrow. Then we may be able to find ping pong bats and balls when we want them. Thanks to Colonel William Butler Bowden's happy procrastination, the books were not burnt. Little short of miraculous, one of them was going to turn out to be none other than the lost manuscript of a copy of the book of Marjorie Kemp. This manuscript was sent to the V&A, which interests me, it's not the, B, not the British Library, but it goes to the V&A to be identified. There, Mr. Albert van der Poo, keeper of manuscripts, sent notes to Edmund Gardner, M.R. James, Dom Huddleston, and a certain Mrs. Moore, inviting them to inspect the copy in its mouse-eaten cover. And it was this last person, Mrs. Moore, a.k.a. Evelyn Underhill, who I'm sure a number of you have heard of, who suggested contacting Hope Emily Allen on August the 15th, 1934, who identified the work. The discovery of the manuscript was reported in the London Times December of that year, and indeed, the newspaper coverage of the discovery is fascinating. After about 500 years, the unique copy of the book of Marjorie Kemp was approaching its final destination. In the Sotheby's sale, 1980, Morris, now Captain Morris Butler Bowden, sold the manuscript and its mouse-eaten chemise to the British Library as Lot 58. And there it resides until such a nuisance as Reverend Dr. Luke Penkett asks to see it and it is placed on his desk for him to view and study. I must say when the book arrived, um, I was in the library with uh, Naylor, who was my previous guide dog. That's the one on the photo that Ellen prepared. Um, I just, I, I had to sit for some time, as we do um, before statues or 
before icons, before paintings, just to, well, take the moment in. If it hadn't been for that manuscript being saved from a burning bonfire, we would not have heard of it. Well, we would have heard of it, but uh, with very little facts. Permit me a moment of self-publicizing. The publisher, Darton Longman and Todd, uh, published my book on Julian of Norwich's literary legacy, a systematic linguistic study of and commentary on the short text. That came out just a few, no, it came out earlier this year. I discovered so much about Julian's stylistic brilliance. She even invents words. Um, there were over 15 of them in the short text alone. Haven't started to look at the long text in the same detail. That's a, maybe a project for later on. I placed Julian in her late medieval context by discussing her literary background surveying other English literary texts of the 13th, 14th, and 15th century. Along with looking at her vocab, I found out about her dialect, her syntax. I explored her rhetorical techniques to find out how she makes a particular point stick. Reading the revelations, several phrases do stick, such as, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. For he, God, enfolds us in his love and will never let us go. God of your goodness, give me yourself, for only in you I have all. Prayer unites the soul to God. He didn't say, you shall not be tempest-tossed, but he said, you shall not be overcome. It's on these that we and folk during the COVID crisis drew on and continue to draw on in times of crisis. After the poor reader has worked their way through all this, there are less technical chapters on a new style of preaching, Father Clive, please note, which developed in the late 14th century on Julian as the preacher, not exactly, not literally, and also on her first readers and listeners. I mentioned that Bishop Graham graciously wrote the foreword. Someone added on, say, <laughs> Back cover, this book will bring richer meaning to Julian's words for those who know them well and assist understanding for those discovering them for the first time, perhaps seeking wisdom and comfort in challenging circumstances or to deepen their prayer life. What a responsibility. publicity over let's remove let's return to london of 1670 because it was in that year that the book 16 revelations of divine love was published by one serenus cressy the long text was now in print and the floodgates had opened the prominent french mystic and christian philosopher pierre poiret included an entry on Julian in his Catalogus Plurimorum, Octorum, he de Rebudis Mysticis aut Spiritualibus Scripturant, Amsterdam, 1707, describing her as Mother Anchorite, and the Revelation de Amor Dei as theological, profound, exciting, and only a year later, he includes her in his Bibliotheca Mysticorum Selecta, library, if you like, of uh, select mystics, 1708. 
then somebody you will know, you will have heard of. In 1745, Francis Bloomfield mentions Dugan in an essay towards a topographical history of the county of Norfolk. Then we have George Ballard, who mentions Julian in his memoirs of several ladies of Great Britain who have been celebrated for their writings or skill in the learned languages, arts, and sciences. Oxford, 1752. 1770, 100 years after the revelations were first published, the German reformed religious writer and hymnist Gerhard Terstegen mentions Julian at length, giving a brief outline of her life. And he quotes from the revelations in his, this is a beautiful title, Selected Biographies of Blessed Souls. Part 18. In 19th and 20th century England and America, we then have a plethora of publications three men published in here and across the pond. And then for Julian's writings in 1901, perhaps the best known and most loved edition appeared. Grace Warwick had her edition published in London by Methuen. Her story of finding and discovering and describing the book um, asking Matthew in to publish it is a very, very beautiful one. I'm sure it's online. Julian's book was translated into modern English uh, by Dundas Harford, Roger Huddleston, Sister Anna Maria Reynolds, Anthony Bale, Barry Windiat. Barry's is as recently as 2016. Many foreign language translations have sprung up. French, Russian, Italian, Catalan, German, Spanish, Israeli, Mandarin Chinese, back to that in a moment, Danish, Dutch, and Norwegian. Right. The, the thing about Mandarin Chinese is, um, before working on Julian, I co-authored a book on Augustine of Hippo. And I knew that was going to be translated into French, German, Spanish, I think, and Mandarin Chinese. Well, the book duly arrived through the letterbox, opened it. Okay, yes, I recognize Chinese because of the way, you know, the order in which they, they write things. Um, but I was stumped a bit when I read the card that accompanied the book. Augustine and His World by um, Andrew Knowles and Luke Penkett in Mandarin Chinese and then in brackets, simple. I didn't think it was at all simple. To have worked on some of these manuscripts, books, editions, translations over the last few years, has taught me that not only has Julian been rightly lauded as one of the first female writers of English prose, but also she's been in the public eye since her visions and locutions were written down by her, recorded as the revelations of divine love. And as Bishop Graham writes, people have turned to her in times of both personal and national and sometimes international crisis. I wanted to give you a picture of Julian and of her revelations first, because alongside all of this, the book of Marjorie Kemp had previously only been known through some extracts printed by William Caxton's successor, Winkin the Word, in 1501, titled, A Short Treatise of Contemplation Taught by Our Lord Jesus Christ, or taken out of the book of Marjorie Kemp of Lynn. These extracts, just a small number, were then reprinted 20 years later by Henry Pepwell as 
a short treatise of a devout Ancress called Marjorie Kemp, Ancress of Lynn, along six other contemplative and mystical works. That was in a collection titled Cell of Self-Knowledge. Was Marjorie Kemp an Ancress? Well, it's at least possible. She was an elderly lady by then, and her years of pilgrimage throughout England, through Europe, down into the Holy Land, perhaps during her visits to Julian of Norwich, a seed had been sown, which now began to blossom. An elderly lady who was no longer traveling by herself in places where she didn't understand the language, and nor they understanding English. Um, Santha Basacharji is a wonderful woman, uh, one of the leading international experts on Marjorie Kemp. And we had a chat one day and decided, yes, the concept of Marjorie as an anchoress can't be discounted. Around the turn of the 15th century, the copy of the original manuscript spent some time up in Yorkshire at the Carthusian Monastery of Mount Grace. And it was here that four, at least four of the monks annotated the text with a plethora of marginalia, revealing a great deal about Marjorie's as well as their own spirituality by the comments they wrote. Coming into the 20th century, Butler Bowden translated the text for publication in 1936 but he put some of the material at the back of the book. The longer introduction, the concluding prayers, and 13 chapters, largely consisting of Marjorie's conversations with Christ. And remarked rather sniffily, I thought, except to those particularly interested in it, the great amount of mystical matter would probably prove wearisome. Oh dear. When I was invited to translate uh, the book of Marjorie Kemp for this series called Classics of Western Spirituality, published by the Paulist Brothers, Paulist Fathers in New Jersey, USA. When I was invited to, to do that, I realized there had been something like a 50 year gap since the publication of Julian of Norwich's Revelations in 1977, again showing some of the inherited favor of Julian's work in contrast to Marjorie. <coughs> the Classics of Western Spirituality series continued with The Cloud of Unknowing, 1981, The Pursuit of Wisdom, and Richard Rawls' English Writings, 1988 and Walter Hilton's Scale of Perfection, 1991. It certainly now feels that the classics of Western spirituality theories is complete as regards their library of 14th and early 15th century English mystics. Now, you might be wondering, why have we waited so long for the Book of Marjorie Kemp to be included? alongside the writings of her contemporaries. More perceptive among you might well ask, why are the Paulist Press publishing such a volume now? Well, for the answer to these, we need to look at the reading public's reaction to what they learned about Marjorie Kemp from books, journals, newspapers, and what's broadcast on the radio. Do you remember the radio? or television, or online, or worst of all, hearsay. Marjorie Kemp, bless her soul, has suffered hugely for most of the 20th century. I mentioned that the first translation of the book of Marjorie Kemp was published in 1936, two years after it had been discovered. This was followed four years later by its first edition. But this was not a happy occasion for its first editors. Sanford Brown Meach and Hope Emily Allen. The time that Hope Emily Allen spent with Meach, 
she suffered from his misogynism. She had a hard time of it. Mitch began to mistreat Alan and try to take over complete editing of the work. Alan also suffered in that she was not a member of the academic establishment. She never accepted an academic teaching appointment. And of course, she was a woman. <coughs> a second volume by Hope Emily Allen herself was prepared in part, but never published. I would love, before I pass away, to see if it's at all possible to bring Alan's notes together and have these published. I think, and more importantly, some members of the academic establishment think that this is possible. Hope Emily Allen, you see, leaves many notes throughout the first volume, and these notes were published, stating where she's going to mention something, where she's going to develop something in her second volume, the one that's never published. But bless her heart, illness in the form of osteoarthritis plagued her in later life, preventing her from travel and research. When I was giving a similar talk to the folk over in King's Lynn, Bishop's Lynn in, uh, in Marjorie's time, I said, there we are, I've been working over the last year on two texts, the translation of Marjorie Kemp and um, a work called uh, The Poor Cative, which has a lot of uh, theological, spiritual, mystical, contemplative, meditative writings in it. Um, never get into the habit of writing two books at the same time, chaotic. Anyway, they, they, they went off um, early, actually, to the publishers. I like to get these things to the publishers before time. Um, and I said to Paul, who is my live-in carer, very supportive chap, um, ah, that's it. And I said to the, the uh, audience at Kingston, right, I've written my 11th and 12th books over a period of 24 years, two years a book. And uh, that's it. No more. Well, we went away for five days, Paul and I and Harry. Uh, six days later, I said to Paul, do you know, I would really love to write the second volume of the book of Marjorie Kemp. I won't tell you what he said. No, he's very, 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 very supportive. Um, Back in the 1400s, Marjorie Kemp was going on pilgrimages from King's Lynn, where she was born, married, and gave birth to 14 children throughout Europe and into the Holy Land. She was heavily criticized both for her extravagant behavior in copying the behavior of holy women on the continent, and also for her uncontrollable crying. Now ask any reasonably well-educated person about Marjorie Kemp or mention the book of Marjorie Kemp to a well-read individual and their immediate reaction will be, oh yes, she was a woman who cried all the time, wasn't she? Engage a little further in conversation and he, they will tell you more often than not that she was mad and they will either laugh or emphasizing with those unfortunates of the early 15th century who, standing outside St. Margaret's Church in King's Lynn, in Bishop's Lynn, overhearing her railing from within, or at first accompanied and then abandoned her on their pilgrimages abroad. I'm with those scholars who predecessors, our predecessors gave Marjorie such a bad press for a number of decades after the book was discovered and who are at last beginning to recognize that Marjorie did not deserve the calumny she received and the scholars are setting the record straight. She was, as it says on Ellen's leaflet, illiterate, 
imitator of continental mystics, mainly though not exclusively female, who received, as I wrote in the Church Times a few weeks ago, God-given and God-controlled tears. Let's look at those three aspects of Marjorie's life. There's a wonderful program on the radio. I think it was yesterday morning and yesterday night um, about Julian and Marjorie's mentioned and um, Marjorie was still described as illiterate. I'll have to change uh, Rupert Sheldrick's um, misconception to that when I see him next. They read that Marjorie used amanuenses and a copyist to write her book, and therefore she couldn't write or read. Easy mistake to make. However, in book two, her amanuensis records John, that's one of her sons, John's mother, when she had a letter from him and knew his desire, went to her prayers to know our Lord's counsel and our Lord's will. And a few lines later, we write, we read, then Marjorie wrote letters to him, saying that whether he came by land or by sea, he would come in safety by the grace of God. Letters, note, not just one. And nothing is made of it, no comment is made, you know, um, highlighting the fact that she was writing letters. Philip Sheldrick, no relation to Rupert, notes in his appendix to a book, Julian of Norwich in God's Sight, one of the best books on Julian. The use of amanuensis was not unusual, even amongst the educated, literate upper classes. But it didn't stop there. As the priest, theologian and martyrologist John Fox, remember Fox's Book of Martyrs, notes in his writings, women of the artisan class in Norfolk, so we're talking about Marjorie Kemp, were said in 1429, bang in the middle of her life, to have been taught to read the scriptures in Middle English, Chaucer's English. Marjorie and her family belonged and had belonged to this class for at least two, three generations. The fact that she had an amanuensis does not mean that she couldn't write or read. And although she wasn't good as either, Marjorie tried her hand at brewing and at milling, and she would certainly have needed to have read and write for both these activities. Marjorie realises that her failures in business were the scourges of our Lord, caused through her pride, her covetousness and desire for worldly honour not apparently through her so-called inability to read and write. Words to Marjorie were important and the recording of words, whether spoken or written, especially when spoken by Jesus, Mary or one of the saints in visions or locutions, um, were very, very important, very, very important significant. Our Lord values the writing of Marjorie's book and says to her on at least two occasions, daughter, by this book many people shall be turned to me and believe therein. Secondly, many of Marjorie's acquaintances we read on several occasions were astonished by her behaviour at home and abroad, whilst others, very often on the continent, accepted, befriended, and made her welcome. When we look in her book for influences on Marjorie, we find on two occasions lists of texts read to her. The Liber Celestis, or Revelations of Bergita of Sweden, The Scale of Perfection by Walter Hilton, Pseudo Bonaventura's Similis Amoris, Richard Rolls' The Fire of Love. All major works of late medieval mysticism known in England in their Middle English translations and all inspiring effective piety 
imitatio Christi, imitation of Christ, and corporeal asceticism in a tradition going back to 13th century Northern Europe. Uh, they would um, actually uh, abuse their bodies. Some of these mystics would uh, drop wax on parts of their body, uh, would go for oh, fasts that neither you nor I could bear to, to think of. Two were Marie Doigny and Elizabeth of Hungary. And these mystics, together with the places where they, like Marjorie, went on pilgrimage, such as Assisi, uh, Danzig, Dansk, um, and of course the Holy Land, cannot have failed to have influenced Marjorie's spirituality as she continued along the way of everlasting life. Thirdly, at least two of these continental women had a profound effect on her spirituality, not least her tears. Marie Donny's life, a major source for the book of Marjorie Kemp, was read in Middle English by Marjorie's scribe, who drew parallels between the two women's weeping. Elizabeth of Hungary, too, cried with a loud voice as it is written in her treaties. These and others put paid to the notion that Marjorie's tears, sobbing, weeping and wailing, were either those of a hypocrite or of a rather eccentric woman. Indeed, Marjorie, if we read the text, tried on several occasions to cease her crying or at least hold it in, or retired out of places of worship or meeting, so as not to disturb the other people. One passage clearly states that God alone is in control of Marjorie's weeping. Quote, she sobbed wondrously and wept, wept as bitterly as ever she did before, sometimes loudly, sometimes quietly, as God himself would control it. It was one other female saint, Birgitta, wife and mother, who had the most profound effect on Marjorie's emotional and spectacular behavior, who persuaded her husband to live in chastity, cared for lepers, went on pilgrimages to receive forgiveness of sins, experienced divine revelations, wept abundantly at the passion and underwent a mystical marriage to God. With those three things understood, then we can move towards November the 9th, Marjorie's feast day. The book of Marjorie Kemp was published at just the wrong time. In the Times, the article runs over the page where it meets a map illustrating military deployments in the first months of the Spanish Civil War. And of course, England was at war. In The Observer, G.G. Coulton describes the book as a very precious psychological document. Then, of course, pundits quickly seized the opportunity to denigrate Marjorie's extraordinary behaviour. Sigmund Freud had founded clinical uh, psychoanalysis some decades before. And Marjorie's critics jumped to argue which negative aspects she was displaying, as sadly some still do today. In a later edition of the Times, Hope Emily Allen writes, the reminiscences of a medieval old lady have lately come to light, crammed with highly interesting narratives of real life. There was a competition to, from the Arthurian scholars in 1934, the year of ping pong balls and bats and the discovery of the manuscript. Another manuscript was hitting the headlines. An assistant headmaster at Winchester College, Walter Fraser Oakeshott, discovered a previously unknown manuscript copy of Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur in June 1934. The book of Marjorie Kemp had a mixed reception. 
on one hand, Graham Greene, no less, writing in the month, discounted the book's religious significance, but wrote, nowhere else can we find so vivid a picture of England in the early years of the 15th century. Dom David Knowles, that fine historian of Western mysticism, wrote that at its rediscovery, the book was recognized at once as a godsend and a disillusionment. On the one hand, the other hand, the book throws light on a period of history that was tense. Henry V had died in 1422, and the long minority of Henry VI had started. The Hundred Years' War had begun in 1340. In the north of Europe, Kingsley merchants and bankers were at odds with their continental contemporaries. And Marjorie's running commentary enables us to enter English and European history with our eyes open. After the impetus of many feminist scholars in the 70s and 80s, notably in England and America, some scholars and writers have now given Marjorie the respect she so greatly deserves. But even so, many of them are still making mistakes. Marjorie was literate. She could not control her tears. Her behavior was not unique. Having been invited to translate to Booker Marjorie Kemp for the classics of Western spirituality, focusing on her spirituality, I've learned that Marjorie was way ahead of her time. Not until the 17th century do we find female writers of autobiography in the persons of Anne Bradstreet, who recorded her autobiography in 1656, and Marjorie Cavendish, Duchess of Newcastle, whose autobiography was published in 1656. I've left one final point for the end, in the hope that each of you will leave with this thought uppermost in your minds. What lies behind the book of Marjorie Kemp? What is the inspiration for her work? Our Lord reminds Marjorie that our Lord Jesus Christ, with his glorious mother and many saints as well, entered her soul and thanked her, saying that they were well pleased with the writing of this book. And there were other similar raison d'etre dotted throughout the book of a similar nature. How rarely do commentators on the book reveal this reason to us? Hardly ever. How many commentators on the book um, revealed that she wrote letters to her son? Never. Remember in A Scandal in Bohemia, Holmes comments to Watson, uh, when it, you remember counting this number of stairs up to uh, Holmes's rooms, asks how many, and uh, Watson, bless him, doesn't know. Holmes says, you see, but you do not observe. For those who of us who have eyes to see, even a little bit, let them both see and observe. But let the final words be left to Marjorie. Coming right at the start of the book, they tell of the reason for writing her autobiography. She writes, or her amanuensis write, when it pleased our Lord, he commanded and charged Marjorie that she should have her feelings and revelations and her form of living written down so that this goodness might be known to all the world. Thank you. Father, thank you so much for bringing to light 
Marjorie Kemp uh, for the leaving, obviously a very misunderstood woman, and it just shows how people can get what we would say today a bad press. Yes. We're going to take uh, a little bit of a break, 15, 20 minutes. Um, there is coffee and tea and biscuits available. There is wine available. Start the old grey matter working. <laughs> and if you have some questions, uh, Father Luke will uh, gladly try to answer them uh, afterwards. That's the most terrifying thing about uh, sessions such as this, because you never know what you're going to be asked. No, it's wonderful. <laughs> so let's take a 10 or a 15, 20 minute break and uh, I'll give you a shout when it's time to resume. But Father Luke, thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to interrupt your conversation, and I certainly don't want to stop you buying the bar at the back. But can we reassemble, please? While we're just waiting, I must say it's such a good idea to have the talk, coffee or whatever, and then questions and answers. It's good to be able to move and stretch our legs. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you've had the opportunity to think of your questions. So who's brave enough to, to start us off? Okay, Michael. Good question. Yes. There must have been so very many more people than we, we know about. Um, not all of them are writing, you know, recording things themselves or um, had amanuenses to, to write them, uh, their writings down. Um, quite extraordinary. If you, if you just think for a moment, let's all think for a moment of that copy. We know it's a copy because um, it's a, a later piece of vellum, you know, um, has a diff different, um, we know it's about 1450, the, the, the stuff that was written on. But if we just think of that in one manuscript coming down, telling us about the love of God. Remember, their times are very similar, actually, in lots of ways to our times. Um, it's a miracle that anything <laughs> survived. Um, partly because, although... Mm, they very often, the female saints very often had spiritual... Um, directors, spiritual counsellors, and they very often wrote uh, histories of the people, uh, sometimes two or three together. I think that there were probably uh, some more things there for us to discover. Um, also, partly, of course, there are, uh, there are 
a great number of females who were like Julian, anchoresses, or if you're a man, anchorites, anchored to the church where they were worshipping. Um, I think there must have been, for every one manuscript that comes down, there must be a hundred ladies whose uh, lives, whose, even whose names we haven't heard of. Um, I think it was, sorry to say, a misogynist period. Uh, men were the boss. Um, for better, for worse. So, yes, you do tend, you probably do get more men saints. Um, you probably do, yes, I'm sure you do get more um, male martyrs. Um, and their lives are written down by men. Such a shame that we... Uh, no, let's turn it around the other way. Such a good thing that we know and read and love uh, writers such as Julian and Marjorie. Thank you for your question. Yes, yes. Mystic, um, I'm afraid that nowadays the, uh, can I say unenlightened, um, think of mystics and crystals and uh, I'm sure people with crystals know what they're doing and are doing a good job. Um, but uh, mystics are male or female people who are blessed, and some, sometimes the reverse, um, in believing that they are addressed by God. Uh, like we might have the occasional um, time when we think, oh, yeah, God said that. These are people who uh, are in almost daily contact with God. They believe. And like Marjorie, um, because it's very difficult, you know, almost impossible, isn't it, to prove something. And maybe there's some good in that. The Marjorie went to Julian, who had um, a very good reputation. She'd had her visions, her 21 revelations, oh, some years before. So her fame traveled. Also, Marjorie travelled from, from Kings Lynn all the way round, probably on foot for most of the way. But she wanted to know, wanted to have Julian's response. Uh, Julian, of course, um, wonderful writer, wonderful recorder of what she believed God said to her. She was a person to go to. She was a go-to person, you know? And she was absolutely certain that these words, these visions, were coming from God. Um, you get male mystics. In fact, Richard Roll and Walter Hilton were writing um, both in the... 15, uh, 14th century, both in the 1300s, um, advice to other people, advice to other Christians. And they were saying that uh, they, had, they had very good advice. For instance, one little thing, would just think we've had some, some really nice coffee to warm us up, like nice wine to warm us up. Um, they said, they wrote down what uh, beginners uh, in um, anchorages or beginners in um, 
communities of monks or of nuns um, should and shouldn't do. Don't be too hard on yourself. Um, both of them write at one stage to the beginners. Don't go fasting, you know, more than is healthy for your body. Yes, Richard Roll, the writer, the anonymous writer of The Cloud of Unknowing, Walter Hilton, Julian, Marjorie, they were all mystics. We had them in this country. We still have them. Uh, Doris Day in um, America was a more contemporary mystic. Um, and throughout the continent, um, there are so many books, I can't think of one specific one, um, which give you histories. But, you know, have a look in the libraries, and, and um, if there's nothing there on mystics, then uh, ask, ask for them to get hold of one. But in fact, Father, you, you have a few in your library, don't you, in your study? Um, on mystics. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Good. Ah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yes. Because God told her to, that seems very odd, doesn't it? I mean, you're right. They, uh, men wore right robes, right gowns, whatever. Um, virgins, and this is a thing, when people saw her, and, and she said to God, you know, this is silly, I can't possibly go around wearing white. I had 14 children, for goodness sake. Um, she was it seems a bit unfair doesn't it god telling her to do something like that and god when she says to god look um i've had a very tough day today you know everything's gone wrong people have been um criticizing me left right and center god says to her and it's recorded in her book good because these things, these criticisms, this ridicule that you suffer, do, I think, two or three things. They stop you from becoming proud. Rather harsh, wouldn't you say? Um, by wearing white, um, there was a time later on when, when God said to her, or she believed, she heard God saying to her, um, you know, can, you, you've worn white for long enough, now you can, you can go around in black, that, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, if you like, it was God's false. But in a way, when the very opening pages of the book um, paint her, if you like, describe her, certainly as a very proud woman you know she was wearing the heights of fashion um, and God was saying no enough it's good and it's good also that you can experience what other people feel because you're going to write this or have this written down in your book later and people will know how to be humble Extra, extra, that, that sort of thing. But yes, glad to hear you've done your homework. <laughs> there is that beautiful statue in St. Margaret's um, uh, Yes. Right, very nice yes. <laughs> Yes. 
absolutely, yes. Um, it was. Woman? Sorry. Because she was a woman, and she was always very polite. I expect that had a, a large part to play in it. Yes, she was ridiculed then. She was ridiculed, you know, in the past century for uh, sixty odd years before people stopped and thought. No, actually, there's something we can learn here. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, yeah. Again, well done. Good homework. You, you've, tra you've trained your congregation well, Father. <laughs> Yes. Do you know it, this exactly? Exactly the same question was asked when I was um, talking in, in Kings Lynn. Um, the uh, team rector there, a chap called Mark, absolutely superb priest. I have a great respect for him. Um, was. Uh, as, as Father Clive is doing now, um, walking among you and getting you to, 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 to ask questions. Uh, it's, he said that it's quite possible that you might even get uh, people today um, who are descendants. I don't want to play that up too much because then we think of, you know, the Holy Grail and all that sort of stuff. I mean, not the actual Holy Grail itself, but what people have made of that. Um, yes, there was so much to discover. Um, for instance, in each village, each town, there were guilds of people. There was a Corpus Christi guild, for instance, in uh, Bishop's Lynn, as it was. Um, and, these, and the names, uh, Marjorie became uh, a member of that guild uh, after the books were written, um, and her name, I've seen the, it myself because I've been doing some work, um, the uh, Kings Lynn record office is, is fascinating. Uh, names were down there. Um, St. Margaret's was there, and I expect, you know, going through the church registers that... Uh, Let's hope something might be found. It would be very, very, very interesting. For instance, um, do you know of, no, make sure I've got the right first name, right Christian name, John Kemp. Was it John Kemp who, who um, danced all the way from London up here? Um, is it John Kemp? Well, I, I hear no dissenters, so we'll, we'll say it's John Kemp. Was he, uh, now he's 16th century, was, I think, he was, was he um, related to Marjorie Kemp? The jury's out on that one, but uh, might have been. Oh, how refreshing. <laughs> you have trained your people well. Yes. Could you please tell us what the Genghis Orthodox Church teaches? Yes. Because it's a church that I never heard of. Yeah, yeah. It's correct that you're a Yes, oh yes, uh, priest and a monk. Um, Yes, good question. Thank you for asking that. I was, um, I am very happily married. Odd for a monk 
to say that, but I am very happily married. Um, as it said on the blurb about me, um, I was a musician and I was uh, trained at Guildhall and then uh, Mon, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I had Charles Rosen as a mentor, I was mentored by Charles Rosen, who himself was taught by a pupil of Liszt, very brilliant American. Um, I believed deeply that God was calling me to a monastic life. Um, and Philippa, my wife, and we see each other about two or three times a year, um, I'm ashamed, not ashamed, but it so happened that she was in my shadow as a musician. In her own right, she was a superb singer and pianist. But she was in my shadow. One day um, in the music shop in Chelmsford, where we were living, where Philippa still lives, um, somebody asked me a, a, a question about doing something. And I said, oh, well, look, you have Philippa here. Why don't you ask her? Oh, no, it's you we want. Oh. My heart sank, you know, like anything. I thought, how, how unfair. And I'm sure it's part of this call. Well, not one of our uh, friends, I don't think we had any enemies, but not, 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 not anybody made a comment that could even be misconstrued as a negative comment, a criticism. There was not one criticism. They could see that this was correct much like Marjorie going to Julian. Um, and for a while I was living on Guernsey um, and was with a very good, very lovely friend, uh, a tertiary Franciscan lady um, in St. Peter Port. We were um, having a lovely chat one day and as I was leaving, one of the books um, flew off her bookcase onto the floor. Well, ew. I was, and so was she, stunned. So I picked it up. It was published by um, L'Eglise Orthodox Celtique, um, and it was a series of lectures given in their annual conference over in Brittany. My monastery is in Brittany. I live as a solitary because they know that God has called me to write. Um, and so I was over on Guernsey. This happened and I said to the lady and I said um, there was a very dear Swedish priest, a uh, Lutheran priest who uh, was over in England. There was a um, sorry, a um, an agreement there should be some Swedish priests coming over here and some priests going over to serve in the Church of Sweden. This was a Swedish priest, Klaas. I said to Klaas, look, you know why I'm here temporarily. Um, I believe this is, uh, this can be, mis <laughs> can be construed as a sign. Okay, so he most generously drove down to the monastery in Brittany, near Redon, um, and the abbot and I, he told me, had, uh, class told me, had um, a four-hour discussion. Um, it's a little orthodox community, um, as the name says. We hear of Greek orthodox, we hear of Russian orthodox, we hear especially in the 20th century, Celtic Orthodox. Um, we study the lives of, we were just talking about we father about St. Columba earlier. Um, uh, we have a passion for Celtic, things Celtic. I mean, not the little sort of trinkets and stuff that, that has nothing to do with Celtic Christian 
Annecy, but there are some also very good books, rather like Marjorie, some very good books about the Celts. And ask, ask, ask Father because he'll point you in the right direction. Um, it's a group of like minded, it was started in the 60s. Lots of things happened in the 60s. Um, and I was ordained and I professed my life vows there. Um, it's joining with the, uh, it's a double monastery, as I say, there were monks and nuns, which is lovely. I'm going to be um, pulled over the th thing for this, but my abbot said that uh, women make much better prayers than men. It's good to have both together. It's natural to have both together, I mean, in different monasteries, but certainly, you know, within um, walking distance, we come to pray, come to um, worship in, in it together. Um, sorry, that's a very long answer, but I thought it was worthwhile um, undoing um, because, yes, uh, just in the same way that we have Greek or Russian, um, in fact, thinking about it, on the continent, there were very, very many different um, nationalities, if you like, if that's not too strong a word for Celts. Um, yes, it's a very beautiful monastery. Thank you for your question. One last question for this one. Okay, thank you everyone for coming along and supporting us in such terrible uh, conditions. I hope you all have a very safe Yes, trip please go home. On. And thank you to Father Luke for bringing to life Marjorie Kemp and some of the struggles that she had in her own day, but also to be recognized in the centuries since. And it is such a shame that people of such theological depth still struggle to be heard in the church of today. Yes, yes. May it be a lesson to us that we need to be open voice of God speaking to us through many and various forms in our contemporary society. So Father Luke, we enjoy having you and Harry, he's quite contented to someone oh, at yes. the <clears throat> um, But we do appreciate the fact that you have made the journey to be with us this evening and uh, don't forget to purchase Thank you. I will enjoy uh, that. I'm currently reading a book on Celtic spirituality, believe it or not, that I purchased uh, when I was in America lecturing on St. Columba. Uh, so we, t we tend to get around. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> very, very thank you very much, everyone, for coming on. And yes. Home. Yes. Please, God.